It's already arrived and uh, we'll commence the program maybe another one or two minutes uh, because still a minute to go. So that one minute I'll take it to explain to you what's happening in MMA next three, four days so that you don't miss it uh, in your uh, inbox and so that uh, you attend all the programs. That is on Monday, day after tomorrow, on the 9th of, uh, not day after tomorrow, on Monday, uh, 9th of October, we have a discussion on the professional handbook on chat GPT. We have a very, very high profile uh, panel. Dr. Palnivel Tyagarajan, you know, Honorable Minister for Information Technology is going to be there. And uh, we have phenomenal amount of uh, things, chartered accountants, technocrats, and then people who are done exceedingly well in this area, all there. So not to miss, please come on 9th of October, same time at MMA. Then on Thursday, because we do an event on Tamil and uh, we do it uh, regularly, uh, Dr. Dr. Thirulwar on health management. The number of couplets uh, which uh, written on Thiruvalluvar Thirukkural, it talks about you know, health and health management and how you personal management lead to health management. Here is a doctor who has done a research on this and uh, he is going to be talking to us. He is again a doctor, Muruga Sundaram, and uh, he is going to be there. And uh, Dr. Rajaram, IAS, again expert on Thirukkural, which is uh, sharing the session. Then we have on the 20th October, Read and Grow, uh, Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Holman, that is a book which is going to be discussed because Srinivasan Ram Prasad, Swapana Sundar, a senior partner of PBS, uh, Giridhar Associates, and Vinay Pushpakaran is there. There are a number of other events uh, happening at chapters and different locations. I am not going to go through that. And uh, I must thank uh, all our members, students. We had an excellent management student convention two days back where over 1,000 people attended, over 13,000 people watched it online. And, um, and some of you missed it, I can assure you, it is really worth watch and especially the competition what we held as a prelude to the, as, as a part of the con convention is the Chanakya, the mastermind, where 5,000 students participated from all over India and top 10 were there on the stage and the girl, Dipisha from IM Lucknow won the prize this time and we had almost all the IMs participating. So watch it and very, very interesting event. And uh, coming to today's event and uh, Mr. Gobalakishan just called me up. I said, sir, you tell me the date, it's already done. And uh, because this is the 18th book, and uh, I am indeed privileged, honored. MMA launched all the 18th book, uh, whatever he you know, returned. This is the 18th book. And um, I, I've seen uh, many authors here spoken earlier on many occasions. He said, they say, they'll say so many things about how he started thinking the book, how many years he prepared, how much he think, ultimately brought out one book. Imagine the gentleman who brought in 18 books. It's, I think they want a big round of applause. Uh, today is a phenomenal. And we are indeed privileged to host this event this evening. And uh, this is a topical subject which is very relevant to a large number of people. Uh, inside the boardroom, how behavior <coughs> trumps rationality. And we have got a very, very high profile panel. We are indeed privileged to have with us uh, Mr. Vijay Shankar, Chairman of Sanmar Group. And uh, also we have Lakshmi Narayan Dure Swami. He is the Managing Director of Sundaram Home Finance. He is also on the treasurer. And our author and our person who is the man behind everything today is uh, Mr. R. Gobalakishan, author, corporate advisor, former uh, uh, Vice Chairman of, uh, former Executive Director of Tadasans and Vice Chairman of HUL. May I request the dignity please take your place on the dais, sir, Mr. Lakshmi Narayanan, uh, Mr. Vijay Shankar, and Mr. Gobalakishnan. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for the distinguished panel for this evening. Uh, the format of the program is as you still, uh, uh, we will have the launch, thereafter we will have a discussion and presentation and talk by the author. Then there will be a Q&A, uh, Mr. Vijay Shankar is kindly agreed to lead the conversation, Lashmi will also join the conversation. Uh, before that, uh, let me have the privilege of uh, introducing Mr. Lashmi Narayanan, Dore Swami, who is the Managing Director of Sundaram Home Finance Limited. Uh, is uh, uh, as for 30 years of experience in financial service industry with expertise and risk management operations strategy. He is also chief operating officer of Sundaram AMC till 2019. Lakshmi Narayan is a commerce graduate, qualified cost accountant, and master of business administration. He is also a member of the managing committee of Madras Management Association. He is an honorary treasurer of MMA and uh, you don't have to worry about money because money is always there available whenever you request it. What Mrs. Lash Lakshmi to deliver the welcome and opening remarks. Sir. Is this better? You still have an echo? Yeah. 
Good evening, all of you. It's indeed my privilege and honor to deliver this formal welcome address at this very special discussion on the theme of the book, Inside the Boardroom, How Behavior Trumps Rationality by Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan. I consider it an honor to welcome this evening Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan, author of the book and former executive director, Tata Sons Limited, and also a well-wisher of MMA in its endeavors, and Mr. Vijay Shankar, chairman of the Sunmar Group. I also take this opportunity to welcome the members of IMA Alumni Association and MMA members from all over Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry, special invitees of Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan, and the large number of participants from all over the country who have joined us live on, uh, this evening. As many of you are aware, MMA was established in 1956 with the aim of propagating management movement in, the, in this part of the country and over the years, MMA has evolved into the largest management association in the country with over 8,000 members organizing nearly about 750 events in a year. MMA has recently been awarded the best management association in the country for the 14th time in a row this year in recognition in recognition of the pursuits in serving management fraternity as the fountainhead of management excellence. You would be happy to know that MMA has been actively working with skill developments of students from underprivileged backgrounds studying in poor schools thanks to the generous support by Access Investments, AS Trust, Super Auto Forge and Flexco Limited. Getting back to this evening, I am delighted that we are having a conversation on uh, yet another gem of a book from Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan, Inside the Boardroom, How Behavior Trumps Rationality, which is a compendium of real-life situations that confront every stakeholder of a business entity. Spread over 12 chapters, this book seeks to praise open the black box of boardroom behavior and offers practical guidance and perspectives to both newcomers as well as seasoned operators. It is commonly believed that boardroom is a safe place to discuss the good, bad and the ugly of the company. Whether the, num whether the members are taking new, uh, whether the members are talking of new ideas, products or services, finances or competition, or just expressing their opinion on various matters, every member is expected to feel comfortable and secure. At times, it may be the place to let out a little of steam poke fun or even make a poli politically incorrect statements because we believe every opinion that will be taken in the right sense and the boardroom talks remain where it belongs to behind closed doors. In that sense, what goes on in a boardroom is a mystery for most of the outsiders. This book not only provides an opportunity for everyone to understand what actually goes on in a boardroom, but the best part of it is it gauges the readers that every statement is backed by and, and every statement is backed by examples in real life situations. The Vedic exhortation of the doing well by doing good is a leitmotiv of the book covering all chapters with due emphasis on process plus behavior. For instance, the author also points out that NASA, Volkswagen and WireGuard governance failures are all relatable to boards ignoring the prodromal of peril and they exhort the boards to not only watch out for such warning signals ahead of time but also prepare a contingency plan to deal with them. In short, the book is a treatise for every manager and a corporate leader who look forward to occupying a high seat in the boardroom one day. Thanks to Mr. R.G. for choosing MMA to host this event. It would indeed be a delight to have to follow this conversation with Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan and Vijay Shankar this evening. I once again welcome all the distinguished guests and thousands of viewers from all over the globe watching this program live. Wishing you a great evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lashminarayan. Uh, now we are come to the most awaited moment for this evening. Uh, we'll have a formal launch uh, of the book and also a photo opportunity. Uh, may I also request uh, Mr. Raji's brother, Nauru, and also Steve, to join us on stage, and also Mr. President MMA, Mr. Mali, to uh, join us on stage, please. Come, come, come. 
Thank you. Thank you for the honor, Mr. Rajesh Shankar. <coughs> Before I request the distinguished chief guest for this evening, let me have the privilege of. Uh, let me have the privilege of introducing the distinguished chief guest for this evening and also the author. Uh, Vijay Shankar holds a Master's in Business Administration from uh, Kellogg's Graduate School of Management uh, uh, and also a Qualified Chartered Accountant. Vijay Shankar is the Chairman of the Sanmar Group. The Sanmar Group has a revenue of over US dollar 1.6 billion. As a Chairman, he is responsible for the group operational management apart from organic growth of the main business. Shankar has been actively involved in Sanmar, entry into overseas, uh, uh, number of uh, overseas opportunities and uh, the Sanmar Group has manufacturing facilities in Mexico and Egypt. San <coughs> Mr. Shankar is the director of the, on the board of uh, KCP Limited, Oriental Hotels Limited, and a number of other man uh, very senior corporates. And he also serves on the board of governor of Medical Research Foundation, Shankar Netralia, and the CPR Environment Education Center. Where Shankar is also the honorary council general of Denmark in Chennai. Very warm welcome to you, sir, and uh, once again, and pleasure to have you with us this let me have the privilege of introducing uh, Mr. Gobalakishnan. is the author, corporate advisor, former executive director of Prada Sense, and has completed his first career with Hindustan Unilever from 1967 to 1998, where he moved on. He was a vice chairman of HUL. In his second career, he served as a director of Prada Sense from 1998 to 2015. Since then, he attained the third career, I can, if I say so, that to uh, as an author of business and commentator he has authored 18 books in english and four translated books not only writing and get it translated to so many other languages the books are more about life as seen through the lens of business and enterprises though may think of him management to write actually very warm welcome to you sir again once again thanks for choosing mma to launch this book it's a privilege and honor to us as I said to you, the format is we'll have uh, a conversation, free flowing conversation between the author and the chairman of the session, uh, Vijay Shankar, and let me also add a question to join. All the viewers watching this program live, there's a number on your screen. If you have any questions, please send it to us by WhatsApp. Our team will collect them. People who are here, uh, yes, we'll pass on the mic to you. Uh, we can address the question to the author, was it relevant to the discussion of the book? And if you have a question slip also available with us, you write to write a question, we'll send you the question slip, you can do that. Now I request Mr. Vijay Shankar to give a few opening remarks, thereafter we'll have a conversation. So on management and related topics, he has also written some wonderful personal books. In fact, I would say I have read many of his books and I would say my all-time favorite book written by him is a, is a book called A Comma in a Sentence. It and said, you, you, you know, my, your father launched one of my earlier books and it, I would like you to do it. There was no way that I could say anything but yes. I have been fortunate to know him through my father, had an opportunity to interact with him a few times, but got to know him more through his various books and columns. In fact, my request to, to Mr. Gopal Krishnan was that he puts together all his columns in the form of a, another book, because these columns are truly uh, worth reading for any management professional. Just one example, and I think maybe even he has forgotten, uh, in one of his columns he spoke about recruiting people when he was both with Levers and, as, he, as you know, he spent many years with Levers, including in Saudi Arabia and with the Tata Sons. And when he used to go through a person's resume and he used to find uh, very many job changes, it would always raise a red flag in Mr. Gopal Krishnan's uh, mind. In his view, and he describes it beautifully in his column, he said every young professional faces challenges in their workplace, especially early on in their career. And if they do not have the grit and determination to overcome that challenge, organizational challenge, personal challenges, whatever they may be, and shine and come through, and rather quit and move on to another company, it was, in his mind, a bit of a black mark. This was something that always stayed on with me, and I'm sure there are exceptions, there are exceptions to this rule, but it has always stayed on with me that somebody who, even when we look to interview, if they have not made many changes, it is something that, that stands out as a positive. 
as I said, I requested him to make a compendium of all his, uh, all his columns in his next book. Uh, you know, we're going to have a free-flowing conversation between me and Mr. Gopalakrishnan, and I'm going to request Mr. Lakshmanarayan also to join in. But this book indeed is a gem for any, any person who's interested in the world of corporate governance and in the world, in the world of uh, how boards are, boards are running. As you know, I guess since board uh, regulation has evolved over the last 10 years, I think this is the timing of this book, as pointed out by one of the reviewers here in a, in a wonderful book review, could not have been more appropriate. And, you know, like, I don't want to come in the way of between, uh, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm cl clearly the starter here, but between the main course and, uh, and then the audience. So if you don't mind, I would go sit there and we'll have this conversation. Thank you. Maybe you request. I think, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vijay, for your comments and Lakshmi for your introduction. And thanks to MMA, the evergreen, unputdownable group captain. Uh, I am delighted because his father did launch one of my books. And uh, if I implement his suggestion on putting my columns together, you'll have to inaugurate that also. So, uh, I thought I might just speak for 10 minutes, giving you some my perspectives, and then we'll better engage in a conversation and questions. I realize that many of you would not have read the book. And if you don't get some idea what is in it, it sounds suspiciously gossipy inside the boardroom. Choli ke piche kya hai? But I can assure you it is not. Uh, my co-author and I, in a discussion, she's an academic uh, in the SP Jain Institute of Management, in a casual conversation, came to the conclusion that there is, just like the moon, you always see one side of the moon. You don't see the other side of the moon because they move in tandem. And Chandrayaan 3 has tried to correct that. We see only one side of a board. And that side is the rules, regulations, of which there are too few in our country, if I may be facetious. And we said, what's on the other side? There's a natural curiosity if you don't see the other side. And we quickly came to the conclusion, the other side is human behavior. And that human behavior manifests itself in everything. It is not only in corporation. The book has been written in the boardroom of a company, because that's my calling. But you can apply it to Madras Gymkhana, Bombay Gymkhana, Music Sabhas, notoriously famous uh, for having complications, sports bodies. Look at the cricket body. Public governance, housing societies, they all suffer from certain human behavioral governance challenges. But this has been set in the context of a boardroom, but if you read it from the point of view of a music sabha or a gym, tennis gymkhana, you'll come to similar lessons. Because human behavior is to do with socialization of human beings. And whether you're wearing a suit, and sitting in an air-conditioned boardroom, or you're wearing a veshti and discussing the next music performance, the human motivations are not dissimilar. So that's the first point I wanted to make. I don't believe too many books have been written on the subject of the behavioral part. And just like Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman came and said 25 years ago, that we are studying too much quantitative economics, but there is a behavioral side to economics, and that gave birth to the whole science or art or whatever you want to call it, of behavioral economics. I don't think we have that status, but we are at least prizing open the box. And it's our first humble attempt to try to place some of the factors. And we are hoping that uh, 
knowledge seeking professional institutions like mma iims will take this further and build a body of knowledge uh, on this subject so this is about behavior you will not find a single line saying section 1 2 what the law says in fact we argue that there is too much emphasis now you can argue about too much i won't defend it on niyam and niti niyam means rules niti means following the prescriptive but there is very little on the on the niyat niyat means what is your real intent if somebody sets up a company saying in 5 years i want to be sunicorn unicorn decacorn whatever corny stuff they want to make that's fine i'm not saying that's a bad goal but that company will behave in a certain way and you should be, if you're a director of that company you must be prepared for it if on the other hand you're a company which says i want to do some larger good for humanity why that motivation should come to you? and it's only not tatas i'm talking about i was just in kunur last 3 weeks i don't think azim prem ji will mind my mentioning it i asked him azim and i are about the same age i said when did it strike you that you must be philanthropic and he said within 2 years of my father's passing away and i came back and he said to be honest i didn't think i should be philanthropic i said i must do this develop vipro company for some other larger cause it was very unclear to me what that larger cause was but today his foundation is worth 240000 crores for every mile between here and the moon mr prem ji has given 10 crores so that's quite quite a lot of achievement and india needs more such businesses and india will get more such businesses because we have very good entrepreneurs a few of them may be odd balls but the large majority of them are well intentioned good people but what they lack is governance and it's not the fault of the chairman or the promoter it's the fault of everybody who styles himself as a director including myself i have been a director now for 37 years on about 25 companies So I've seen it in India. I've seen it in Sri Lanka. I've seen it in Middle East. I've seen it in England. And apart from the cultural differences, there are some commonalities in this, and it is that to which we address ourselves. But some are peculiar to us. Deference to the elder. How do you deal with the head of the family? Uh, it can't possible to write a book. You can't write a procedure. You can't tick in the box. We say board evaluation. Uh, today a number of boxes come and uh, i don't mind admitting if you want report me to sebi or whoever is doing the evaluation they tick every alternate box and you get approximately what you mind and that's what everybody else does that's fine you can do that but is there something more than that and i've had some experiences of trying to explore what is more than that but i won't go into that at this stage we'll keep it uh, if it comes up later on uh, i then asked myself sorry i keep saying i because my co-author is not here please read v for i we asked ourselves listen if somebody is going to buy this book what do we want that person to do with this book we said it's got to be a book that he or she can read on the flight between chennai and delhi two two and a half hours so we said it is must be 200 pages or thereabouts there's a lot more subjects we could have covered but we didn't want to compete with ram goha because we were not writing a book of that uh, scholarship as ram goha does so that is one constraint self imposed constraint and we said we will single mindedly focus on the behavioral aspect the second question we asked is okay people read the book they say yeah yeah i recognize that but what can i do about it so on one of the pages of the book we have defined what is called a prodromal test and the prodromal test is how to interpret the advance signals that you're getting when you're a director of a company you know the behavior of the people around the table gives you an indication of how people's minds are working but you can't be sure of that 
and if you get it's like a readers digest it pays to increase your word power and if you get more than 12 out of 15 we say that's a dangerous company think whether you want to be on the board of that company then we got some other grades if it's below 5 we say it's probably okay he's got some human aberrations but that like all of us human beings have aberrations a company will also have its aberrations so we thought it's a good idea i have applied this prodromal test to several institutions i have been associated with where i was competent to grade it whether my grading is right or wrong can be debated and i tell you it is like a rough instrument it works you can't take every single number and extrapolate it and do correlation re- regression analysis but it works and so we have shared that the second thing we asked ourselves is okay i have done the prodromal test and it's getting a score of 13 out of 15 or whatever that means danger signal what do i do about it because if i'm a director especially an independent director then you say shall i make a noise shall i thump the table uh, that doesn't always solve the problem so we have developed what we called a 7d process which appears on one of the how you escalate the matter from discovery to departure with measured steps in between and i've seen this also in the corporate sector cg power would not have been brought to book if the whistle blower weren't the independent directors Tata Finance would not have come into the public domain if Ratan Tata had not blown the whistle on his own company. In CG Power, the independent directors blew the whistle on the chairman of the company. I mean, this looks impossible, but when you read the case, which is described in the epilogue, you say, "Hey, it's possible." It's a question of how diligently I take my tasks. So the second thing that I draw your attention to is the seven D process, and the third and the last, somewhat. i hope i don't sound uh, 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 too proud of my body of work but in the epilogue we have described a new concept called the fly on the wall concept and the fly on the wall is not an auditor he may be an auditor but that's incidental it's an independent person he may be another senior executive who is retired or who is not retired he may be an uncle aunt somebody who can hold a behavioral mirror to the face of the directors i have done such an assignment for two companies and i cannot describe myself as having done a great job but i think it helped a little bit and a mirror can't make you beautiful or more beautiful than you are but it can tell you where you are not beautiful and then you can apply makeup or change your hairstyle or do whatever you have to so these three things in particular i think are somewhat distinctive arguable and some of you may not agree with it but i commend you if those of you who read the book to look at the 15 point prodromal test the 7d action step and think about the fly on the wall to see whether you would like to experiment with it and with that i'll stop and then maybe we will engage in a discussion thank you very much MMA for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Gobal, for uh, describing your book so succinctly in a few minutes. And if it's okay with you, I'll I'll kick off with a with a question. Uh, you speak of niyam and niti and and niyat, and uh, you know the focus on rules versus the intent. uh if i could ask you uh, is that not a primary test when an independent director is invited to join a board that the independent director has done this sort of test uh, of the company you know using his, his checks to see is this a company whose intent whether it's a promoter led company or not and we'll come to that later is that not the first test that he he uh, takes into account before joining the board he should but i don't think they do Uh, i can't speak for all the independent directors but for many people and i can't tell what percentage it is but for some people i will not put a percentage on it it's prestigious to be a director of a company and the closer they are getting to the age of 60 the more prestigious it appears to them there's nothing wrong with that 
but then I'm not sure when your niyat has been influenced whether you're applying the test at all. And uh, if you see some of the controversial companies that we have seen, SIFI, I'm not talking of the role of the independent directors, but that's all in the public domain. It would appear that either they were not, the test was not applied, or after applying the test, they did not apply the prodromal test. One of the two. I have not come across a single scam, at least not in my knowledge, where after the scam has been uncovered, people say, ah, I could see something. See, if the dark clouds are there, and the wind is cool, and gust, uh, gusty winds, and you fail to take your umbrella. To say, I wanted definitive proof before I took my umbrella. Well, you'll get wet. I think this, if your son who's 20, or daughter or son who's 15, changes his behavior, his or her behavior, at a very delicate age, you read the prodromal signals if you're a good parent. Now, you have a choice of coming down like a ton of bricks on your child, some parents do that, they imprison them. Some others say, well, it's for them to make it up. But most of us try to put a guardrail on it. And that's all that we are saying of a prodromal test. I've just given it a nice word because MMA will not invite me if I don't have some big words, you know. Sir, just a follow-up to what he was talking about. You know, the, the test that needed to have been done by the directors on the board and when there are early warning signals that you could, you could see. But is it also possible that, you know, a new director who's just joining on the board is, is really overawed by the rest of the personalities in the boardroom? Look, I've just joined here and I am surrounded by stalwarts, you know, who've been around for a while. And if they don't seem to ask any question, then there is something that's right that I'm not able to gauge and keep quiet. So what's the question? So is that is that the, 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 the reason why some of these are not unearthed earlier is not because they don't know, but it's just because they are overawed by the personalities in the boardroom? It's a possibility. I mean, you cannot possibly discount. All of us are human beings. I mean, this is not to cast aspersions on them. When I joined the board of Tata Sons, who was sitting around the boardroom? Nani Palkiwala. Ratan Tata, Darbari said. You think my voice was clear? Let me admit it, yeah. I said, these Maharathis are sitting here. Let them all talk. But that's not an excuse for you not to express a concern if it has come to you. And that distinction is very important. We have talked of several biases, especially a new director, women directors. You know, they feel isolated. I'm the only woman. I've got my first time to be a director. I must be seen to be part of the club. I know if I keep asking, or some women want to establish that they are not part of the club by asking so many questions that the board meeting doesn't go beyond agenda item two. Because they've got so many questions. All these things can happen. But by making yourself aware of it, there's a chance you can do something. I'll give you an example where I did it and succeeded, in my own opinion. I know I'm talking about myself, but I can't talk of other people's experiences. You know what is today called Tata Play? It used to be Tata Sky before. A proposal on the Tata Sons board that we will tie up with Murdoch and we will set up this joint venture. And uh, the proposal was we will not put the Tata name on it. We will call it Sky. In England, it's called Sky B News. And everybody around the table said, the yeah, proposal looks good and we should not put the Tata name on it. I come from branding background. I said, if this is going to go into, I don't know, 300 million TV sets in the country. If you don't put Tata name on this, how will you brand Tata? Not on your steel products, who the hell is interested? So I, like a pipsqueak, I said, I think we are missing an opportunity. Some debate happened. Uh, luckily, in the Tata board, they were very open. And if you see Tata play at the bottom right-hand corner of every evening, I think I had a small little role in that. So, 
what i learned from that is directors must learn to disagree agreeably it is very easy you don't need training to agree disagreeably or to disagree disagreeably but to disagree agreeably is a skill it's more important than learning lodr if you know what i mean it's a bloody waste of time but you have to do it so you do it because you rely on your company secretary or somebody to explain what is the lodr sounding name is lodr but these things are very difficult to learn and those are the things that i am drawing attention to which you must learn there was another occasion i'm giving practical anecdotes so that it doesn't sort of they may not even be in the book uh tatas did not succeed in telecom that's in the public domain so i'm not revealing any internal secrets back in 2000 2001 there was a little discussion whether we should go for cdma technology or gsm technology uh the chairman ratan tata was in favor of cdma i'm not a telecom expert he probably knows a little more than me but only a little more he is not that he's not a telecom expert had it been automotive i would have been more uh, careful but after the debate was over i came out talked to one or two of my colleagues i said you know should we really be going for cdma which is supposed to be technologically more sophisticated but not so widespread it's like saying i will only speak in sanskrit because the sanskrit language is such a superior language but nobody else talks to you in sanskrit that's what cdma was to me whereas gsm is hindi but everybody speaks it tuta phuta so they said if you feel so strongly you should go and talk to chairman so i had to find the right time muhurtam and all that but i did talk to him and i did not succeed but this was not an ethical question you know nobody was siphoning off it's a difference of opinion professionally and uh, i never said you know you made the wrong decision that's why we are now in this mess but when we got into a mess we all found our ways to get out of it so i'm giving you these as examples of saying it's important whether you're an independent director or a uh, promoter or a majority shareholders director to be able to find a way to express what is bothering you and discriminate between things that have an ethical overtone and things that are totally professional if i could switch to uh, something else you have spoken about in your book which is promoter led companies and the promoter is dead and if i could be a little uh, provocative here uh, it's you want to promote good promote <laughs> and it's good to say that the promoter is dead but it needs a whole change in set of regulations the definition has to be removed banks should not ask for personal guarantee of the promoter uh, at, at all levels of organizations so it's 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 a it's, it's in my view a little fanciful to think that the promoter concept is dead in india and in fact i want to provoke you a little bit more in asking you about the man, the functioning of boards in non promoter led companies and non promoter meaning non government led companies non psus or non family owned companies or non mnc listed companies it's the fourth category which is emerging which has got neither of these three as as, as a promoter so would you would, would you would i be right in asking you that the governance in, in those companies are far better than the governance in the first three categories of companies let me deal with the substantive point you are making about promoter led companies it's a good question you are asking no other country in the world has a concept of a promoter india is the only country in the world so i got curious because you know company law and corporate structure is not my specialization and this led back like it all happens all our sanskars come because your grandfather taught you something or great grandfather taught you something we had this thing called the managing agency system so from the managing agency system when that was abolished in 1961 or thereabouts uh, this concept of a promoter came but it became a monster when banks said i'll hold you responsible the banks wanted an easy way to catch somebody you know if i am a vishnu bhakt i'll look at a statue of vishnu and say vishnu ka patpa you know but if i have no vishnu in front of me what do i do who do i pray to 
So the banks were perhaps instrumental, I won't say responsible, for creating this mythology, a promoter. You can be a majority shareholder. That's fine. And there are majority shareholders all over the world. But why call him promoter? You don't have to change a lot of regulations for that. The moment you use promoter-led company, that promoter thinks the company is his, which is rubbish. It's not his. And I want to refer to a debate I inadvertently got involved with in Calcutta, where I was on one side, the other side was the chairman of a cement company, who openly said, this is not 1890, huh? this is 2000 and something. He said, this is my company, I'm running this company, so I can hand it over to my son, and my son will do the same for his, his son. And I said, I beg to differ. If your son is competent, I have no problem. But uh, it's not your company. You're only 61%. He said, only? I said, yeah, only. There's 39% somebody else. The moment you take 1% of public money, it's not your company. It is just like your child. Till 18, you can say, this is mine. But when the child is 50, you can't say it's mine and control everything. And that's the distinction I'm making. I don't know what is involved in eliminating this word promoter. I don't know. Call it majority shareholder. I have no problem. And the family is a majority shareholder. They have some rights. Just like uh, uh, Ford Motor Company, the Ford family has a majority shareholding. The moment you use the word promoter, you know, language is a great... Um, can also misguide people a lot. People get up with the feeling this is my company. And there are consequences that come out of that. Very often the son or the grandson or whoever is competent, but I suppose as many cases he's not. Yeah, on, on, a, on a similar subject, I had a, a question for... You know, one of the one of the biggest challenges that um, the corporate India is dealing with today is succession planning, uh, and and it's more so in promoter-led companies, like you just said, where you know if the promoter were to think that this is my company and therefore I'm going to pass it on, and you've dealt with this topic of uh, you know the tenure of the the CEO, what it should be, and is it is it something that um, is it something that you believe that you know, prescribing something, say, you know, 10 years is probably the right answer or you should leave it to the wisdom of the board because if there is a professional CEO who is good enough to continue, should I just relax the rules? What's your view? Because even when the, when, when, when we had these rules brought in for the banks, there were a lot of views, you know, for and against these rules and this debate is still not settled. What's your view on this? I can tell you, I am not going to express a view which will settle the matter. Because this is a complex issue. I am respectful of alternate views. But I can only express what I have found to be a good practice. Um, you have to understand uh, what happens to a guy who is made CEO. So I want to go to the backstory. And I have written a book on this, by the way. Book number 15 or whatever, called Crash. A perfectly normal guy who has been advanced to the position of, don't, I'm using the word CEO as a moniker, take executive director, vice president, any senior person. Because he is competent and he delivers results, he has advanced. He has some behavioral aberrations like every human being, but nothing to catch your attention. When he becomes a CEO, something happens to the guy. And I'm using the word CEO in a broader sense. Don't think of it CEO as CEO. Um, and I have come to the conclusion in my book, Crash, I've written this, that he suffers brain damage. Sorry. Now, what do I mean by brain damage? I've given all the physiological and neurological research papers. I'm not... A... Just like if I take iron filings and leave it alone, they'll all be disoriented. The moment I put a magnetic field, they will all get aligned in a particular way. That's what happens in the human brain. The result of the brain, impairment may be a better word, damage may be too strong a word, 
the result of the brain impairment is that person loses empathy, the ability to listen to people, he loses uh, reality, touching reality, feet on the ground. All these are lost. You take away the magnetic field, he is retired now, he's not CEO, he's a nice, humble, sweet chap whom you used to know 15 years ago. Right? I am not free of it, I should add. Those who know me will say, yaar, you should have seen this guy at this point of time and how he is now or how he was before. None of us is free of it. So this is not a commentary on other people. Now, why do I say it must be a tenure? There's a high probability, though not certainty, that if you stay in that job too long, the brain damage becomes permanent. Right? And once it's permanent, then he will not step off either. My experience and observation is that first five years a new CEO is trying to find uh, and understand his role. You know, things are a bit unfamiliar. He wants to be successful. The next five years he says, I've got the hang of it and I will now take some actions to leave my imprint in the company. He is like a young daughter-in-law. Let me understand this mother-in-law psychology before I take actions. Then she says, no, the coffee will only come at 7 o'clock. You will not get it at 6 o'clock. Second half, five years. After that, he may still be, he or she may still be successful, but is starting to have declining increments. So I arrived at 10 and I'm certainly not in favor of legislation. There is one more law. Loader, folder, they'll come with one more. I'm not a great admirer of the regulatory system, not because it's bad, but because they have an impossible task. They have to control behavior, but they are doing it through laws. What can they do? So I'm not in favor of more regulation, but creating awareness because 98%, you 99% know, of the entrepreneurs, family driven businesses, professionals are decent, good people. They want to do a good job. And for that, we, um, Nani Palkewala used to say, because 2% of the people do wrong things, 98% get a law. And we all know that that's true. But the, out of the 2%, there's some big fish who no law applies to them. They appear in the newspaper every morning and nobody dares to talk about them. So, that's the reality. No more laws. Uh, yeah. Being a little provocative on no more laws, uh, would you would it be right to say that without the CTLODR and the company laws, those the two main laws that, that guide the running of boards and company, that the change that we have seen in uh, improvement in corporate governance and in improvements in board performance in India would not have happened. Voluntarily, I don't think we would have seen the changes that we have done, whether it's people retiring at 70 or 65 or 75 or no more than two terms or auditor rotation. I mean, whatever be the, the laws, without the, the laws, they may seem stringent, but without them, I don't think we would have seen the, the improvement in corporate governance standards that we have seen in India in listed companies. I think you make a very valid point. I agree with you. I hope I didn't give the impression that I'm against laws. If you remember your old physics lesson, it's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. That's my problem with laws. People who think they'll give one more amendment. I mean, there are companies where by the time you want read the first circular, the amendment has come. You don't know which one to read first. So my point is, don't use a sledgehammer to swat every fly that comes your way. But you need laws. Of course you do. I'm deeply respectful. I've even served on some committees on the subject. So, it is important. We talked about, um, you know, the, the, the independent directors and the ability to read early warning signals and then how people should uh, voice their opinion even in a boardroom. Uh, there are instances of, there are examples that you've quoted of, uh, um, you know, uh, several uh, uh, names that you've mentioned there. There is also, um, there are there are corporate failures and there are corporate frauds. Uh, do you distinguish between them in, in, sen in the sense that the, as a role of a director, 
you know, there could genuinely be a miss from, you know, someone on the board not being able to catch an early warning signal and then let it go in the assumption that they didn't know that this was something that they should have raised a question, but they just let it go versus something that is intentionally done and as if that results in a corporate fraud. I think there's definitely a distinction between a failure and a fraud. So, if you suddenly read in the newspaper that in company XYZ, he didn't pay back bank loans, to immediately assume it's a fraud, uh, would not be right. What is the distinction between a fraud and uh, an error or fault? What is the word you used? Failure. A, failure. a failure is the ancestor of a fraud. When there's a genuine failure, if you're willing to admit it's a failure, then you don't go to the next generation. But very often leaders are not willing to admit it's a failure. And to correct that Failure, they do another one which fails even bigger and soon it becomes a fraud. Example, Satyam, since it's in the public domain, books have been written on it. One thing didn't go right, so he tried to find another way, Tata Finance. You know, we used to discuss in those days, that this guy looks uh, super aggressive. He said, we need aggressive managers in Tata's, you know, mm -hmm. sounded good. <laughs> Later on, we found that one or two deals didn't go right. And he couldn't come back to the board, so he did another deal to do another deal. And sometimes they spin out of control. So, admitting a failure is not a sign of weakness. We all make mistakes. And you can't have business and entrepreneurship without failure. And that's why I love to ask younger people, especially those who are in startups and SMEs, and what are you building? You can't make a building of a business without a failure, right? And I think there is a distinction. And your book also uh, uh, talks about the difference between uh, intent and, uh, and action. So it does draw a distinction there as well. In the public domain, I got an afterthought after writing the book. I re refer to achar and vichar. There's also a word called prachar. You may have one vichar that results in some achar, but then you give a totally different prachar. And if you look at the public space, <laughs> you find a lot of examples yeah. of that. So people who are very eager to tell the world that they will be this in some indeterminate, not in, they give you in years, by 2040 when he knows the people listening to him will be dead and gone, I'll be this. There also prachar takes over in the place of vichar and acha. Perhaps one final question before I open it to the, to the audience. Question on, or practical question on the increasing role of domestic institution and uh, I guess the institutional advisory service firm getting more active in, in India. Any comments or thoughts on that? Because I guess that brings a whole new dimension into how the boards and companies are run. You know, it's a very good thing that we have domestic financial institutions, institutional advisory services. They are developing. The fact that a 2% shareholder can bring a whole company down, if that happens here, we will say Swaraj Paul has been recreated. <laughs> right? I think uh, a board I'm using the word board rather than CEO because it's not one man. The board is governing the company. The CEO is running the company. The chairman of the board manages the board. The CEO manages the company. They are mutually accountable to each other. And an institutional advisory service or even financial institutions who ask relevant questions. But unfortunately, we have not matured in that process and we have work in process. So you catch hold of some guy. Sometimes there are very good people. I can think of, say, Jitender Bhargav from IDBI, who was the independent director who caught the um, CG power case. But sometimes you get a guy who's been a very loyal general manager, audit and accounts in some bank, you just send him. He doesn't know what the hell's happening. And he doesn't try to find out either. 
that may not be a good practice but that's not the fault of the system that's a failure of a particular good device which you created but has not been used properly i have deep regard i have seen institutional members of boards who have played a very very deep and solid role because they come with that background of a financial institution of what type of loan you should take what type of um, priority it has if something goes wrong what can go wrong have you got enough cover of interest for that etc and those are in incredibly valuable i guess the question here is it suggests to sport what are the lessons in cricket i guess it's very contextual to the world cup for the corporate and from the corporate to cricket from cricket that we can take to the corporate world everybody in the bcci should read my book <laughs> this is a question from jaswant from hoso uh, from an organization called hoso i don't know if it's a, a city or a, a company could you share some practical strategies or tools that board members and executives can use to incorporate behavioral insights into their decision making process how can the board be compared on this evaluated yeah i'm assuming you know um, i don't have a pat answer for you and it's fair that i admit that but i have a directional answer for you i have been trying to prevail on the institute of directors the institute of company secretaries i have made presentations at uh, uh, some of these places institutes of management uh, and i'm now doing it to mma when you do corporate director training by all means tell them it's very important they understand loader and clause 49 and quarterly results and all that but please have a substantive module on boardroom behavior i don't think we've written a seminal book it's not going to get the pulitzer prize it's not our intention but we have to build on this how do you do behavioral training how do you train directors to be able to disagree without becoming disagreeable how do you train people to try to get their word in in spite of being new these are real challenges it's not you can't just sort of brush them off and i have found at least talking for myself a lot of solace rather than give them a lecture on ob don't go to the closest management institute and get all of the professor of ob he may be he or she may be good but that's not the solution i have found a lot of solace in the puranas how did vibhishana manage to communicate to ravana that executing hanuman is not a good idea we all know the story so i don't have to ex explain it to you we all know that story why did bhishma keep quiet when draupadi was being disrobed now these are profound and you will find answers to these not from a behavioral scientist but by reading some book or talking to an elder or some scholar of the subject and they give you clues and personally talking for myself i have found it helpful and i used to conduct a, a case study uh when i was doing some teaching of an investment banker in new york who at 45 had a three bedroom apartment out uh, opposite central park and pretty wife lovely children and his company for some reason thought he should go to an outward bound um leadership program and they went to nepal to climb some mountain and then he describes a guy who thought he knows everything you know if you're a new york investment banker you probably do think you know everything though you probably know very little and then he found a sadhu in the snow dying naked no clothes and he got a moral dilemma should i stay back to help the sadhu or should i carry on on my mission 
unrelenting to climb because I've come so far. Now you can have a debate on this for a long time. But it brings out the nuances. A lot of Westerners, this case was being taught in Harvard. I took it from there. A lot of them were Westerners. And they said, uh, oh, it's a human life. You're sitting in Harvard. You can't say ignore it. You know, it doesn't sound nice. So they all said, you must give up your mission and help this poor sadhu. Until one Indian person said, but I, outside my house, every day I find a lot of people. <laughs> I'll never reach my office if I try to stop and help everybody. <laughs> See, the context has determined how you think about it. So I think there are stories and cases that can be built up. And there the OB professors from uh, institutes of management can help. And giving them in a three-day program, one day to the behavioral part, or make it a four-day program if you must, would make them more self-aware. Question here, please. By, By the way, I practiced this, uh, um, if I may just add, if I may just add, in a board where I was a chairman, I said, how do I deal with this behavioral part? And I started a practice. After everybody had ticked the boxes, the annual general meeting was over. I got the board to have dinner with me, or we had dinner together. A little bit of C2H5OH helps, you know, loosens up the tongue and the mind. Sorry? Yeah, but the golf doesn't work with people who don't play golf, you see. And uh, I said, what can we do to make this board better? Not what can you do to make yourself better? And uh, the white gloved fellow goes around with a little brown fluid. It helps. And soon after, about half an hour, 45 minutes, you do get some, you do get some uh, uh, good suggestions. And uh, that's what I've been trying. Uh, so I'll just ask you a question, Mr. Gopal Krishnan. See, I'm, I'm talking on the startup world. A lot of money is flowing into it, but you're also seeing equally a lot of governance issues. The question I have is, you know, across the board, you'll find some few funds virtually controlling a large number of corporations, you know, including in the US like BlackRock or Vanguard. Effectively, they control many companies. So the question is really, if you really want to influence much more, you should be controlling these funds or making these funds more accountable. What can we do? Because they have disproportionate influence now globally and even in India. What can we do to help these entrepreneurs who many times get pushed? I find many entrepreneurs just succumb. I'm an early stage investor. But the moment the fund comes in, the entrepreneur poor chap gets pushed to the wall. And he is really a slave to these funds, right? How do we do things that can make sure the funds are also taken care of? I mean, in a very respectful way. No, no, I will also resp uh, equally respectfully reply to you that I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is nothing to do with startups. It can happen in grown-ups also. Where there's a majority shareholder, yeah, my co-author is sitting right here, Mr. Narayanan, and I wrote that book together, What Can Startups Learn From Grown-Ups? Because you can say there's a majority shareholder and he's pushing the CEO. The CEO knows the bread and butter comes from the majority shareholder. What can the poor minority investor do? Sell your shares and go away. But in the startup case, you can't, don't even have that liquidity. So you got to do a bad deal. You see, he can sit and preach about what uh, training you should give to the hedge fund or the uh, angel fund or whoever, the venture capital fund. But that would take us away from the course of what is within our realm. So I think the fact is that just like a director has to be wise and do his due diligence before joining a company, an investor also must do the same. And an investor knows, even if you're an angel investor, that, listen, if I do 10, maybe 3 will come right if I'm lucky. 7 will go wrong. You're right. They create one-eyed monsters, especially some big funds coming from Japan and that, sort, that side. But that's the way it is. When you're in the jungle, don't expect to meet a gentle panther. When there are panthers in the jungle, you have to understand there are panthers. Yeah. I have a, I have, th you know, three people asking nearly a similar question. Manikantan from Salem, Aishwarya from Chennai and Rahul from Bangalore. Could you elaborate the importance of understanding human behavior in boardroom dynamics? Can you elaborate on the psychological factors that often come into play during high stakes corporate decision making? That's what the book is all about. 
प्लीज रीड माई बुक इट गिव्स मी सम रेवेन्यू एन एन एबिट Anisha from Delhi has uh, what inspired you to write this book and what message or key takeaways do you hope readers especially in leadership roles will gain from this That's an excellent question uh, you have observed that I wrote this book well after retirement but it gave me a chance one of the great benefits of retirement is you can sit and think dispassionately about your own actions and past and you don't mind admitting that you made a mistake whereas when you are in the heat and the throes of action to admit you made a mistake you don't even have the time to think about it you know the next morning again you are overtaken by events and in one such reflection i said you've been talking about behavior i have been trying to sell the idea to various institutions like institute of directors uh, company secretaries uh, associations that you must have here but what do i mean by that and can i be honest and say where have i failed as a director and where have i not failed and am i willing to admit it and when i came to the conclusion that i'm now at a stage in life when i, I can admit it we wrote the book it's very important because when you're not willing to admit that you made a few mistakes then you're the perfect director suit boot cut director you know but life doesn't work that way one of my most painful moments i don't mind sharing this it's i don't think it's i will not mention the name of the company that's not appropriate i was a new director in a tata company and somehow i didn't like the smell of what's going on but the people sitting around me were uh, maharathis what should i do if i go telling people that you know i don't like the smell in the place they'll get some new change the phenyl or the uh, sanitary inspector so i started going through the minutes far more carefully than one would normally do and started picking up inconsistencies i then started traveling because i said the best information a ceo can get in a company is to talk to the most vulnerable people in the company ceos get so distance from the most vulnerable people you know salesman distributor vendor who is supplying you some fine chemical which is 1% of your uh, value of purchase but uh, is a very important vendor people who have been associated with the company for a long time you have to find a way to keep connection with them and through a set of processes like that i am not proud of it but i was instrumental in getting the guy fired <laughs> but i have to admit that i was instrumental and then it taught me lessons on how to avoid getting fired myself <laughs> thank you this is one question from shreya jayaraman can you comment on women on boards and any specific advice for women directors i don't know if i have any uh, intelligent comment to make on it so i'll make an unintelligent one i genuinely believe i was a great skeptic you know when it came 10 years ago or thereabouts uh but over the years i have found that they have a different way of looking at the same thing i wrote another book called six lenses which i launched here in mma it is not about women and men but why do people look at the same thing and come to different conclusions and yet they style themselves as rational people you know it's a mystery and i do believe that if you can get more than one on your board not because some law says it but because they have a different way of looking at it make them feel more self assured because if you're if you're one man in a board of women uh, none of us has experienced that because <laughs> we 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 don't know what it feels like i can tell you i was one of the very few hindus in jeddah when babri masjid was broken i know how i felt to be a minority and everybody thought that i was getting a fat salary and sending it to india for breaking babri masjid so we must not leave women in that situation and one way is to get two three of them and they bring a very different perspective and if i may illustrate it just one attribute men get very hassled when they have to do many things at the same time 
because men's minds work as a map. I have to go from Bombay to Delhi. My first will be Thane. After Thane will be Akola. After Akola will be Mahu. After Mahu, I'll reach Bhopal, etc. Men work on mental maps. Women work on mental compasses. Mota moti, this direction is right. And if the compass is facing the wrong way, they'll change. And I think what makes them that way is it's damn tough. The toughest job in the world to be a mother to a child. Men don't recognize it. I can plead guilty, but I suspect many of you will also plead guilty. And women deal with the baby crying, nappy changing, you know, all the things that young mothers have to go through simultaneously because they use a compass. And I've seen when my grandchild is crying, my son or son-in-law is looking up Google, Dr. Spock. And what my daughter or daughter-in-law does is, hey, Shalini, Padmini, Ragini, how did you solve this problem? Thank you. Tack. Problem solved. Men are still going through Google. So I think they have a different way of solving problems. I think it's very valuable. And I'm not saying this, I don't need to say it for uh, public consumption. I genuinely feel this. At least as a husband of one wife and the father of uh, two daughters, I can say that's my experience. On a related uh, question, excellent answer. On a related question, I think uh, on diversity, and this is not, I guess, men versus women. Uh, Aruna A uh, from Philips Domestic Appliances asked, "How do you see appreciating diversity as a trait that is critical to make the boardroom a, a leadership room?" Yes. This is how do you see appreciating diversity as a trait that is critical to making the boardroom a leadership room? I see it as. Uh... The future leader will be experienced in that. You know, when I, I many people say, oh, your career is 50, 55 years. But that's a short time in the history of mankind or, you know, management. But I can certainly say anybody, anybody in my age group will say that the type of a archetypal top leader 50 years ago, metaphorically, had blue eyes, square jaw. He knew more than his subordinates. He sat in his room, you went to him. You asked him your doubt and he answered it intelligently. He put a little bit of fear in you. Uh, he was that kind of a person. Harold Janine in ITT. Or Sewell Avery. Uh, we have Indian ones, but for not to generate a controversy, I will not mention the Indian names. It is safer. These guys are all dead and gone under the ground. Jack Welch, more recently. That will not be the leader who will lead. If those people took a reincarnation and put back into the boardroom, they will... Today's the future leader will display vulnerability, will display doubt, will not be throaty, will be soft-voiced. Could be soft-voiced. I'm not saying he should be. And will be able to deal with diversity as an advantage rather than as a burden which he has to discharge. I hope that answers the question. But just as a follow-up to that, uh, should we also be looking at diversity, you know, in a very broader sense rather than just at gender diversity and, and go by uh, regulations? And, and, you know, your book talks about that where we need to have thought diversity even in boardrooms. You know, you don't want a group thinking in a boardroom. You want people to voice different views and different opinions and be able to do that. Is that something that you would also subscribe to? You know, to say I will not, I'm not subscribing to it sounds a bit uh, anti-Deluvian. But to say I subscribe to it gives it a tick, tick in the box which I would not, would rather hesitate to give. I want you to know, since you asked the question, when I went to Arabia as the chairman of the company, for the first time in my career, and since then, I've not had that experience. I had 16 nationalities working in my company. 16. I had a Swede, an English, an Indian who was settled in England, Englishman who settled in India, you know, French, Dutch, Arabs. And for me, all Arabs were the same. But frankly, a Moroccan is very different from an Omani. And since I was completely confounded with how to deal with the diversity, because they had very, very different views. 
I requested Unilever to sponsor me to a program in INSEAD in Paris at a nice time of the year. Nice to be in Paris and to give the impression that you're studying hard in INSEAD on how to manage diversity. It taught me a lot of good lessons, which I shan't summarize now because uh, that's not the purpose. But slicing and dicing diversity to a, uh, infinitesimal components is self-destructive. As you might see in our public space going on right now, which is not something we were going to discuss here. You can go on then saying every board should have at least half a variety of this and three quarters of a variety of that. And then you screw it up. So diversity has to be in broad clusters. And uh, it's a separate subject. I will not go into that. I think you answered the question. I think it's a fair uh, reflection. Thank you. There is a question from one Mr. Jayesh Shah. As an experienced professional and an experienced board member, did you do anything to make a new board members feel at ease and encourage them to participate? I must have had several lunches with these guys. To be fair, I've also received free lunches from other boards where I was new. In short, I made a small effort. I don't boast about it. There's nothing to boast about. But I could see. I'll give you one example, since I'm sitting in Chennai, with this point about diversity and all that jazz going on. Mr. M.S. Anant, I think he was a director of IIT Madras at that time. And I was the vice chairman of a chemical company. And I thought it'd be a good idea. And after getting approval uh, agreements, we invited MS Anand to come and run a board of Tata Chemicals. He's a very nice man. Uh, he's obviously knowledgeable in his subject. But the mumbo jumbo that is going on in a boardroom foxed him. He's an academic, that's it. You know, if you asked him about the design of the next distillation column, he could keep you busy for the next five hours. But if you told him which type of instrument you should use to diversify your equity, he had no and after about three, four meetings, I went out of my way to try to make him feel comfortable. He came and said, listen, uh, I'm a good chemical engineer. This is a chemical company, but I'm not able to contribute to the board. If you can advise you on anything that you want my advice on, with or without payment, I'll give you the advice. But save me this pain every three months, especially discussing EBITDA before <laughs> exceptional items, EBITDA after exceptional items. So he quietly resigned and went. It is very decent of him to have done that. One from Suraj uh, from Delhi. What is the most significant misconception that individuals, including board members, have about rational decision making and how does it affect corporate governance? Uh, not uh, peculiar to boards. It applies to gym khanas, clubs, music sabhas, building societies. All human society. But I will keep it to the board because that's the context in which you've come. But I want to keep pointing out why are clubs so controversial here? Yeah? <laughs> A club. You just go there to play tennis and badminton. A music sabha. You just want to get some people to come and sing or play the violin. But they become very controversial. And that's because every human being thinks that he is rational and surrounded by irrational people. <laughs> In Bombay, we have a Maharashtra Cooperative Societies Act. And uh, since I was the chairman of my society, we had a visit from one of the officers. And I said, Kyo aapko, uh, I, 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 he said it in Hindi, but I'll repeat, I'll say it in English here. Uh, don't you think the Maharashtra Cooperative Society Act is very good? I said, your act is very good, but the definition of a cooperative society in India is the unique ability to assemble people who are fundamentally uncooperative <laughs> and try to get cooperation out of them and your act is not contributing to it, for sure. I don't think he was happy with my answer, but that is the truth. Fundamentally, 
human beings have to admit all human beings that they are not rational decision makers if amor swersky said it or daniel kahneman said it they get the nobel prize if i say it mma will give me thank you vote <laughs> thank you i think uh, thank you sir what a fascinating evening i think we can let go keep uh, because every word what you see is a word of wisdom i've been listening to you privileged to listen to you for the last at least 16 years so many books sir we are indeed blessed ladies and gentlemen very very warm warm round of applause to go back to the day to do this and uh, may i request uh, mr balraman and uh, mr gobal to do the honor of presenting a memento on behalf of mma because what we giving giving some more books for him to read sir balraman sir We got all the three past presidents here. I think it will be a privilege for us to do that. Come. Yeah. Come, sir. Get it. Gopal, wonderful. I see you. Lovely. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, viewers who watched live. Live. So many questions have come from you. We tried to accommodate as many questions as possible. Thanks.